Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting us to talk here and uh, thank you Rick uh, for switching with me slots. Yeah, uh, I cannot be here tomorrow so, so thanks for making all this possible. Um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, Cartesian controllers and why we believe it's a good thing to have them yeah? and what exactly the control approach is behind this and then show that we have been using this for um, more than three, four years now, quite successful. I will show a bunch of applications where this has been used, uh, give an outlook what else uh, you can actually do with this, uh, combining it with some deep learning technologies, for example, and finish with a short conclusion. Um, so why do we need Cartesian control? Um, so you can use it for advanced closed loop control, for example. You can use it for direct teaching, manual guidance. So um, basically all these things um, get more intuitive uh, using it in Cartesian space, like dynamic target tracking, um, teleoperation. operation. So, so most things we think are in Cartesian world and using ROS control in Cartesian space does have a lot of advantages, yeah. Um, so if we look at industrial applications and challenges there, we often have also contact-dominated tasks, yeah. Um, we're trying to mount or assemble things, and we want to keep it robot independent for some, some reasons, especially looking at it from a ROS perspective. So um, I would even go a bit further and say, Okay, let's not only look at Cartesian space, but maybe also at Cartesian compliance. So you can have passive compliance. I don't want to look at that. So we're looking at active compliance. So you want to have some relationship between forces and um, Cartesian space. And then there's basically two approaches. You can do it in an impedance way. Um, which I will not look at, but I will look at the Edmonton's way. So you're trying to map forces to um, uh, motions and basically this means uh, you can use the impedance way if you have a very advanced robot control system using force torque sensors in each joint or you can use a rather classic position based control robot and uh, enhance it with the system I would like to show you. So what is our approach? Um, first of all, ROS. Yeah, so we said we want to reuse it uh, we want to make it available. Uh, I think everybody is convinced that ROS is a good idea in this room. Um, and then, okay, then let's use ROS control as it is there. So what do you need? You need a robot that is a position or has a position or velocity streaming interface. You somehow need the uh, ROS control hardware extraction uh, using uh, providing the, the accurate interfaces. And there's a lot of those available for many kinds of robots. Um, then you need our library, which is called Cartesian Controllers. Um, and it offers a few different options. I will go into detail just slide by slide. And then you can set up a whole bunch of applications using this. And in very different variations, you will see uh, you don't always need a force control, a force torque sensor, but uh, you will see what, what uh, options you have using uh, this setup. So basically it's these three. Um, we offer a very simple way of using Cartesian motions. Um, so when you want to follow a, a moving target um, or the targets might be sparsely sampled um, and you, very, you want a very smooth uh, motion, maybe not a highly accurate motion. Yeah? Um, and you don't want to solve inverse kinematics which is interesting, or you want to use force control. Um, when you want to have uh, the robot in contact with something, uh, looking at the, the wrench, uh, you need a force torque sensor at this case, but, but you want to focus on force control, or you want to basically combine both worlds and using compliance control. So you could, for example, follow a moving target, but you can also react to external disturbances. Um, but again, in this case, you will need a, a force torque sensor. So uh, let's get into some math here. Yeah. So we will start with some rigid body dynamics. And uh, yeah, so what we want to do basically is we want to, to have a virtual force that pulls our TCP and then creates 
the, uh, ex the joint accelerations which we then can use can to control the robot. Um, so I will change the direction of the equation. I want the uh, accelerations, the joint accelerations, um, and uh, I don't care about these things. I don't want to look at the Coriolis stuff. I don't want to look at gravity. So I'll just simplify my whole system. Um, so this is a very simple virtual dynamics setup. And um, basically, this allows me to do a direct um, conversion from uh, forces to joint space. And so this is the virtual force I, I want to apply to move my, ro my robot TCP to a new desired position. And um, so we do then is uh, we, we basically calculate an error. Um, depending on the controller concept we're using, you can use a motion controller or you can use the force controller or the uh, compliance controller. And uh, this error is then used with some control parameters you can scale. Um, so we're not only looking at the error, but also the deviation of the error to create this virtual force, um, as we've, we've just seen. And uh, we then insert that here, and basically this is our control approach. Um, and what you see, we're not solving inverse kinematics at any point, and we're not solving uh, inverse dynamics. We're just using the, uh, the, uh, the tensor um, of, of here to, to calculate these values. So uh, this is basically the, the, the core controller which, which we look at. Uh, we have this virtual force here at the beginning. Um, I, do I have a laser pointer? No. This one here? Ah, okay. Yeah, you do, you, we, so we have this admittance part here where we change this force to the, the uh, accelerations, and then we have the error calculation here. So uh, looking at the pure motion control setup, we have the uh, forward kinematics, which is easy, uh, and we create a uh, position or a pose error, so it's in 6D, of course, and then uh, have this is the whole control approach we're using here. Um, then we can change that uh, to a pure, pure force control. So we look at these uh, force errors here, feeding back the real forces from a sensor. And uh, in next stage, we can combine both and have the Cartesian uh, control here. And um, so this is a, a, a rather simple approach, yeah? but it gives you a lot of uh, potential to do things, which is really nice. So one of the things um, why we're doing it this way, uh, getting the real um, dynamics of a robot is not that easy. Typically, the manufacturer have these. We don't. Um, it's hard to get. Um, and actually, it doesn't even change a lot. So uh, what my colleague Stefan, who's actually the, the head of all this, <laughs> uh, he, he, he sort of uh, showed that um, you don't really need the dynamics. Uh, you need the dynamics to solve the inverse kinematics. So our dynamics model includes the, the, inver uh, the, the kinematics in the david hartenberg conversion. Uh, and actually, uh, he found out that there's a better way of uh, setting up a virtual dynamics model um, that does a better uh, task space uh, linearization than others. So what you do here is uh, we actually look at this and we put the, the virtual mass in the TCP uh, and then we can uh, show that we are able to, to linearize in the, in the uh, space, in the Cartesian space, a lot better than any other approach. This was just recently presented uh, two weeks ago in, in Brazil. So if you're interested in the details, there's a whole paper on that. Um, oh, I skipped one, sorry. Uh, let me go back. So, so what does this at the end do? So now we're looking at uh, force control, force control mode. Due to the fact that we're not solving inverse kinematics, we don't have any singularities. And it is computationally really easy. It is really fast. Um, uh, we don't care about the dynamics of the robot. We don't have to know how much any parts weigh. Um, and it's really smooth motions. Um, in this case, we do need a force torque sensor, though. 
Um, we can put this to a different robot. Um, now we're looking at Cartesian compliance. So what you can do is you can change the stiffness of the robot. Um, you still don't need any other information about the robot except the, uh, the um, kinematics model. Uh, you need a, a force torque sensor and, and it works really well. But you can also use it uh, with no force torque sensor at all, uh, just using the motion controller. Um, and you can do really nice linear motions. Uh, you can actually do dynamic target uh, tracking, which we've been using in many different applications, uh, not depending on the robot at all. Uh, no force torque sensor needed, no inverse kinematics, uh, no dynamics. And uh, well, we've been using this in a whole bunch of applications. I wanted to show you how flexible this approach is and uh, how many chances it offers to, to solve different issues. So we've been using it in a, uh, in a cookie decorating scenario, yeah? So the, the core thing is where we're uh, mapping a motion of a human directly to the robot. So there's, again, basically this dynamic target tracking. Uh, it's very low latency due to minimum calculations that we're using, and we really have a nice intuitive, intuitive way of controlling uh, these PILTS arms without having any inverse kinematics or whatsoever. Um, but we've been also using this in different uh, projects. For example, the UROC challenge, which uh, our team won. Uh, uh, it was a huge European challenge, and this part was on uh, flexible assembly tasks. And so here we're using uh, the Cartesian compliance to actually mount in uh, uh, these tiny pins in the back of this rubber ceiling. And uh, so this big robot has gotten really sensitive and we've added some really nice advanced assembly strategies based on some, some force uh, compliance skills. Uh, but we also do stuff like this where we combine it all. So we have a dynamic moving target. Uh, we add uh, compliance in only one uh, dimension in the Z dimension here, and we can just combine it and uh, have a dynamic uh, following and screwing. We can actually uh, scale up and down the speed of the conveyor, and the robot will just dynamically adapt and follow, um, which is really nice. Uh, you can also use it for human robot collaboration, so we we use it here to, to do screw assembly, uh, where we need also these linear motions uh, to have a, a nice uh, fit onto the screwing head, but also to, to have the uh, needed pushing force that you need to do a very uh, good screw assembly, um, which is also easily uh, done here. And um, yeah. So you can, basically the nice thing is you can dynamically switch between these controllers during runtime and just change it in the way you need it. And um, so my colleague Stefan is really deep into this uh, topic. He's been looking at on how to use these for the assembly of really char challenging uh, parts. You can see here, uh, these were some, some space parts and they were really tough. Uh, to add, and, and what he did is he actually had a, um, a human doing some, some training on this, a virtual training with a deep neural network. Um, and here you could see that, uh, so, so he, oh, it's not running, let me see. Yeah, so what he does is he, um, he basically uh, uh, had a gazebo simulation and, and was doing this very simple um, training of these, uh, uh, inserting these blocks here, and they could um, get stuck uh, due to the, the, uh, um, yeah, the, the setup. Um, so these parts actually here, they, they stick out about two centimeters. And um, what we did is we, we, we learned these force strategies, how to react on, on forces in a simulation environment, transferred these to this uh, deep network and then executed that um, on, on, on the real robot. And it uh, works out really well with this uh, very abstract control approach um, because it's basically using these virtual forces to solve this issue. 
And you can really transfer something that was trained in simulation because it, it has these virtual strategies to, to comply with these uh, uh, difficulties that, that uh, this, this uh, well, it's a, it's a hard version of the peg and hole challenge, I would say. Um, and and that's, that's how you can transfer these, I think, really nicely to, to a challenge like that. Okay, um, so uh, my conclusion is, um, yeah, you should not control in joint space. You should control your robot in Cartesian space. Um, I think that has a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of advantages, and as long as your robot is able to offer a, a joint position velocity streaming interface, you can uh, enhance this just by using our repository, which was released four weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's on the GitHub here, and uh, you can really use it in many different kinds of applications. Um, you can use it just for Cartesian motions, you can use it for force control, but also compliance control. Um, if you want, you can really dig in deep into science and have a look at all the math that is behind it. There's some really nice publications available here. Um, and of course, um, uh, Stefan and I would be also very happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, Stefan is not here today, but, but you can write him a mail or just uh, catch up to me during the coffee break, ask me, and uh, I'd also be happy to answer any questions now. So, thank you. Thanks, Arne, for the interesting talk. Uh, so, any questions? to Arne about the, this approach. Yes? Thank you for the nice talk. So what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages are that you are not precise. So, um, so, so you, you have to think about it that like, uh, so you have your robot and you're pulling it with a force into the, the desired position. And so you, you lose the 100% precision. Depending on how, how strong you pull, it will be more precise following this. Um, but in, in many applications, uh, you can reach a high precision that is suitable for, for a lot of things, I would say. So if you're in sub-millimeter accuracy, that won't work. Um, but if you're combining that with force control, which I think should be the solution in most cases because I don't know, hitting the head of a screw, I think that's something you should do with force control and not with position control. And if you combine that, then this works again. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Do we have experience with No, but we have, uh, so uh, we have, put it to many other robots. We also put it to a, a six-legged walking robot, which has full torque-controlled um, joints. Um, uh, we had the chance to use it on an over-actuated, but we did not, actually. We, we should try, but I don't think um, it, it will, it will um, have any difficulties. So what you, what you cannot control is um, which uh, redundancy of the kinematics it will use. Um, but it will never get unstable. Um, so if you have, a, I don't know, seven degrees of freedom arm, it might have the elbow outside or on the other side. So you have to take care, but basically we do that by defining joint positions as over, uh, overall points where we change the controllers and then you can control this. Um, but yeah, there's a bit of freedom in the system that it can use there, yeah. Okay, thank you, Arno. Yeah. So, um, thanks for the really nice talk. <laughs> and